If you know who I am, it means you've watched at least one of my numerous Afterlife Evidence videos on YouTube. With around half a million views in the first three years, with versions in English and Portuguese for Brazil, in my terms, this hobby of mine has been reasonably successful. Because of this, I thought that my racy novel with a spiritual theme might also succeed, but I was mistaken. Despite favourable comments on Amazon, it is by no means a bestseller. Lucky James is a story about a couple who win a fortune on the lottery and what it does to them. There are Kindle and Kobo versions and a paperback for the UK. But the truth is, I've given away more copies than I've sold. The reason I mention this book now is the reference on page 165 to Gore Vidal, the renowned American essayist, screenwriter and novelist. He asserted that one god religions are easily the greatest disaster ever to be inflicted on the human race. And with wars and religious oppression in mind, it's a view I can sympathise with. This is the reason that I've been reluctant until now to review the life of William Stainton Moses, a renowned British medium born in 1839 in Donington in Lincolnshire. His father was the headmaster of Donington Grammar School, shown here, and when he was 13 they moved to Bedford. Later he won a scholarship to Exeter College, Oxford, but before his final exams his health deteriorated, so he went abroad to convalesce. On his return he received his MA degree and in 1863 he was ordained an Anglican minister. But by 1869 he was ill again. This time Dr Stanhope Templeton Spear helped him to recover and he stayed with the doctor and his wife, becoming a tutor to their son Charlton for seven years. In 1871 he became a lecturer in philology at London University and a teacher in classics and English at the University College School, a position he held until 1889. When Charlton grew up, he became a composer and professor of piano at the Royal Academy of Music in London. Like his father, Charlton became a convinced spiritualist and he was also Moses' biographer. While Stainton was ill in 1869, a man named Lord Adair published a remarkable book entitled Experiences in Spiritualism with D.D. D. Hume. It describes the amazing mediumship of Daniel Dunglass Hume. And when Stainton Moses read this book, being sceptical, he described it as the dreariest twaddle and so much stuff and nonsense. Little did he realise that within a few years he would develop into a medium with abilities similar to those of Hume. In fact, these two men are regarded as among Britain's most influential mediums of the 19th century. From all reports, Moses was a modest man who abhorred publicity, while Hume enjoyed meeting the most illustrious in society, including Tsars and Emperors. Charlton Templeton Spear wrote that his father and Stainton Moses often discussed religion together and were drifting towards agnosticism, when Mrs Spear persuaded them to attend a seance with the famous American medium Lottie Fowler. During that sitting, Lottie gave Moses some very evidential information regarding a friend who had died. His curiosity thus aroused, he sought other seances, including with D.D. Hume. As a result, he realised he possessed mediumistic abilities too, so he began sittings of his own with the Spears and a small circle of friends. On March the 30th, 1873, spirit messages started coming through Moses, mostly but not always by way of automatic writing. The spirits informed him that they preferred this method so that Moses could establish a body of teachings. And this resulted in two books, Spirit Teachings, published in 1883, and More Spirit Teachings, published by Mrs Spear after his death. Dr and Mrs Spear had made meticulous notes on the Stainton Moses seances. In regard to automatic writing, Moses said, I cultivated the power of occupying my mind with other things during the time the writing was going on, and I was able to read abstruse books and follow out a line of close reasoning while the message was written with unbroken regularity. Messages extended over many pages, and in the course there's no correction, 
no fault in composition, and often a sustained vigour and beauty of style. He also remarked, It is certain that the mass of ideas conveyed to me were opposed to my settled convictions, and incidentally, often opposed church doctrine. The teachings came from a band of 49 spirits, under the direction of one called Imperator, who announced that he'd come to explain the spirit world, how it's controlled and the way that information is conveyed to humans. These writings lasted from 1872 to 1883, 11 years, before gradually dying away in 1887. When asked how anyone could know if what he was teaching was true, Imperator replied, the progressive soul will receive what the ignorant and prejudiced will reject. God's truth is forced on no one. Two other spirits, known as Rector and Doctor, were also frequent communicators with Moses. Being closer to the earth frequency, we're told they were better able to get through than Imperator himself, who was an advanced spirit residing in the so-called seventh sphere. Moses explained that his spirit would stand next to his body when he observed automatic writing, while the spirit of Rector held one of his hands on Moses' head and the other on Moses' right hand, which held the pen. Moses reported of Rector and Doctor, I could hear perfectly well the voices of the spirits who spoke to me. They sounded very much as human voices do, but were more delicately modulated, as though from a distance. According to Charlton Spear, by simply placing his hands on a heavy mahogany table, nine feet by six, Moses, or the spirits, could levitate it despite its otherwise requiring two strong men to move it even a few inches, a feat that took place in daylight. It's claimed that spirits levitated Moses himself at least three times, and on one occasion raised him onto a table before then floating him onto an adjacent sofa. Other phenomena Charlton Spear reported included witnessing communicating raps, the appearance of lights and luminous hands, the making of musical sounds, a pencil writing with no hand holding it, and the delivery of items known as apports into the locked room. Moses' seances frequently featured various scents, musk, verbena, new mown hay and an odour referred to as spirit scent. Mrs. Spear was impressed in September 1873 by seeing the spirit named Mentor holding a light in his hand with his arm visible up to his elbow, described as being long, thin and not at all like the mediums. Charlton was particularly struck in 1874 by the sound of beautiful zither music. The whole thing was most marvellous, he said, for there was no zither in our house, and it is an instrument that cannot be mistaken. These physical phenomena continued until 1881, and yet during all these years Moses never made himself available for empirical investigation. Indeed, the sceptic Frank Podmore, an influential member of the Society for Psychical Research, speculated in his book Modern Spiritualism on how Moses might have produced his phenomena fraudulently, even though he never witnessed these for himself. On the other hand, a long-standing friend, a barrister named Mr. M. J. Hood, declared, I believe he was wholly incapable of deceit. And Frederick Myers, one of the renowned founders of the SPR, said, I have never heard anyone who had even the slightest acquaintance with Mr. Moses impugn his sanity or his sincerity, his veracity or his honour. Moses himself acknowledged that he'd heard himself described as an obstinate, confused and irritable controversialist, but despite this his reputation stands high. Finally, there were reports about Moses regarding the passing of matter through matter, not just apports appearing in the room. 
So I'm going to digress here to show you two photographs. These are not specifically related to Moses himself, but they do demonstrate the point. This one shows two entwined metal rings, claimed to have been formed by spirits demonstrating using their ability to put matter through matter. Since metal is malleable by man, skeptics could naturally claim this is how these interlinked rings were created. But this second photograph is another matter altogether. Two rings of different woods melded together through each other in a way that cannot be easily explained. Could this be what is called a permanent paranormal object? But back to Moses. I can only say, Charlton Spear explained, that the teachings were delivered in a dignified, temperate, clear and convincing tone. And though the voices proceeded from the medium, it was always immediately apparent that the personality addressing us was not the medium himself. And the ideas were often not in accordance with those held by the medium. And he added, in the case of spirits who controlled Staint and Moses regularly, we came to know perfectly well which intelligence was communicating by the tone of the voice and the method of enunciation. The reason I've been reticent about featuring Staint and Moses in my videos is my preference not to get involved in the non-evidential, essentially religious statements that characterize these teachings. To say that Moses was levitated before witnesses on three occasions is either true or it's false, and you can decide for yourself whether to accept or reject an event described by reliable witnesses. But Moses' teachings are more than this, offering support for the one God religion that Gore Vidal described as the greatest disaster ever to be inflicted on the human race. So I prefer to avoid non-evidential religious statements. For me, consciousness surviving death is about the nature of reality, and that's all. Statements of religious belief, however, do not pass my acceptability threshold. However, we have arrived at the point where a few teachings from Imperator's spirit band can't be avoided. Imperator asserted our spirit names are but convenient symbols for influences brought upon you. In many cases, the messages given are not the product of any one mind, but the collective influence of a number. We deliberate, consult, and in many instances, you receive the impression of our united thought. Regarding barriers to spirits influencing mankind on Earth, the following was said. Men become so absorbed in the material, that which they can see, grasp, and hoard up, that they forget there's a future spirit life. They become so earthly, they're impervious to our influence, so full of earthly interests that there's no room for that which endures when they've passed away. This leaves no time for contemplation. The body is weary with work and anxious care, and the spirit is well nigh inaccessible. And in line with my own reservations, Imperator acknowledges there's a point beyond which it's impossible for us to present evidence. We're not of your earth and cannot produce for you the kind of evidence that would weigh in your courts of justice. We can only dimly symbolize truths which one day your unclouded eye will see in their full splendor. Now, a lot of the writings revolve around Christianity and Jesus. You inquire from us what position we assign to Jesus the Christ, they say. This we know of Jesus, that no spirit more pure, more godlike, more noble, more blessing and more blessed ever descended to find a home on your earth. None bestowed more blessings on humanity. None wrought a greater work for God. Now, to be forthright, this is precisely the material that I do not like. For although elsewhere in the teachings there's a denial that God is an anthropomorphic being, nonetheless the impression gained from these teachings is of a father God with a personality. For me, statements like these support precisely the legends without evidence that established religions rely upon. Take this statement, for example. Faith to be real must be outside the limits of caution and be fired by something more potent and effective than calculating prudence or logical deduction or judicial impartiality. It must be the fire that burns within, the mainspring that regulates life, 
the overmastering force that will not be at rest. This is that faith that Jesus spoke of when he said of it that it was able to move mountains. Personally, I hope that when I arrive on the other side, my new spirit life is not engendered by this kind of religiosity. But despite my reservations, I know that there are others who get a great deal from these books. Here are three comments from a recent blog discussing Moses. Stafford Betty, a professor of religious studies, claimed spirit teachings and more spirit teachings have had more to do with setting up my personal philosophy than any books I can remember reading. Another commentator described Moses as a great medium who brought superb higher spirit teachings recognized by those who are able and willing to study and comprehend them. And a third wrote, the works of William Staint and Moses are among my favorite afterlife books. The guides communicating seem very wise to me. So I acknowledge the possibility of being in a minority on this. But here's another example of Imperator's religiosity. Friend, we do not dishonor the Lord Jesus, before whose exalted majesty we bow, by refusing to acquiesce in a fiction which he would disown and which man has forced upon him. No, assuredly, but they who, from a strict adherence to the literal text of Scripture, the spirit of which they've never really grasped, have dishonoured the great father of him, have impiously, albeit ignorantly, derogated the honour due to the supreme alone. The holding of a narrow, cold, dogmatic creed in all its rigid, lifeless literalism cramps the soul, dwarfs its spirituality, and clogs its progress and stunts its growth. Well, at this point, I feel like saying, here endeth the lesson. And it's true that much of the teaching is written in old-fashioned, flowery style, using biblical words such as ye and thee and thy and thou. Just the kind of thing to put me off. But let's change tack. One thing I haven't mentioned was Moses' role in establishing the British National Association of Spiritualists. In 1881 and 1882, he also helped to found the Society for Psychical Research and from 1884 until his death was president of the London Spiritual Alliance and the editor of its journal, Light. Few people know that he was also a Freemason. In addition to the books I've mentioned already, he published three other books, Spirit Identity in 1879, Higher Aspects of Spiritualism in 1880, and Psychography in 1882. So spiritualists view him as a very active man who made a very significant contribution to British spiritualism. To find out what you really think about Moses, my video is not really enough. If you want more, you can read the entire Moses writings for free at this website. There's also the SPR's Psy Encyclopedia with a shorter overview. In his last years, Moses is said to have suffered extreme depression, nervous prostration, and severe neuralgic pains. In September 1892, he was thrown from the top of what was then called an omnibus. They would have been open-topped in those days, and he sustained severe injury. After recovering, he caught influenza, but never completely recovered. He died aged only 53 and his body rests in a neglected and forgotten family plot in Bedford Cemetery. Still, his writings live on today and will continue to do so as long as there's an interest in a spirit dimension. Thanks for listening.